I'm Robin Bennett, one of the co-founders of the Dog Gurus, and Susan Briggs is over there. She's the other co-founder of the Dog Gurus. And our topic today and our uh, goal is to help uh, business owners launch, grow, and profit their pet care businesses. And so we offer staff training programs and we also do business consulting. And our newest adventure is we are actually branching out to help pet parents as well. So we're taking all of our uh, knowledge and we have started a another branch of the dog gurus called roughly speaking for pet parents so ask us about that sometime and we'll tell you more about that we're really excited about it though anyway what we're going to talk about today here on the facebook live is going back to games you can play in your playgroups to keep things safer and we talked about this a little bit i don't remember a few weeks ago I don't know, all of the Facebook lives start to mesh together after a while. But we had a lot of people asking questions about how to do some of the games and what the games look like. And so we did pull out some of our videos to show you today. So that's what we're gonna try to focus on those. And if obviously, if you have questions on anything, feel free to post those questions in the comments and we will just get kicked off with whatever you wanna start with, Susan. I don't know if we wanna talk about the, the activities first and then show some videos or yeah, I think we'll talk about how they came about because way back when you and I, we still had our daycares and we're operating and we, it was when we were trying to figure out how to teach people the canine body language, but then also how to keep the play group safe and what were some, you doing, Robin, and some of the staff that had it that made the difference and made the dogs easier to manage for them. And that's when we kind of came up with, along with other people who had been doing daycare, that having using cues definitely helped and doing mental work with the dogs would help keep them safe and so we with other people's input decided that the recall being able to call a dog to you could be really beneficial and i think this the video is, does a great job of demonstrating that the group sits are a great way to get a dog out of just reacting and thinking and it can calm them down can help lower arousal plus it's i think a good challenge for the handlers and these games not only help the dogs have something to do but i think the real value is helping the handlers have something productive to do that makes their leadership more evident to the dogs and therefore it's that self-fulfilling um, prophecy and then of course Probably the most challenging one is that gate management, and that's the one that I think has become so popular in the daycare games, which is a real challenge of skill for handlers to see how they can progress in being able to safely keep dogs away from the gate boundary so that dogs can come and go from play groups without getting mobbed. Yeah, and the gate boundary training, I remember years ago when Heather Stoss was the first one that introduced us to the fact that you could actually teach all, a group of dogs to stay back from the gate. And when we saw it with her pictures, and it's one of the pictures that's in our book right now, we, we were amazed. And so we started teaching others how to teach that. And I remember there was a ton of resistance at first. And we, <laughs> you've never done this in your pet care facility. There is still a ton of resistance from people who don't think it's possible. But then when we started doing the daycare games, and that is one of the exercises, one of the games in the daycare games is gate boundary training. How can you get the dogs to stay back from the gate while you open the gate? And a really advanced handler can actually open the gate and move out of the gate. So they're not even blocking the gate and the, the dogs will still respect that boundary without using force or intimidation or you know punishment or any of that. It's all based on just working with the dogs and building that relationship. And now we see just amazing things that people are doing all the time with the dogs. It's just a matter of practicing. So if your facility doesn't do this, it does take practice on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. I put in the comments that you should, this, these exercises should be daily requirements of your daycare handlers, along with obviously monitoring the dog. They help the times you walk back there and your key employees might just be sitting, <laughs> sitting against the wall or sitting in a chair or saying they're bored because they don't know what to do. There's stuff to do um, outside of just cleaning, obviously, which they should be doing anyway, but they should be working on these exercises with each and every dog every single day. And human nature is 
we will work with the dogs that know the behaviors because we like the reinforcement. So we'll keep calling the dog we know will always come to us. But you want to actually work with every dog and there should be a way of making sure that your team's working with every dog. If you find a dog that doesn't ever respond, then maybe they need an additional training session outside of daycare, which is obviously a revenue generator for you because I would charge for that. But there's a ton you can do without having special one-on-one -on -one sessions with the majority of dogs while your team is back there. So teaching them to do recalls with every dog every day, teaching them to do gate boundary work with all the dogs every day, teaching them to do group sits with the dogs every day and working on their skills. That's how you're going to increase their behavior of your team member, but also of the dogs as well. So let's show a couple videos. So one of the biggest things that we talk about all the time is that boundary training and how do you get the dogs, first of all, to just body, use your body to keep them away from things or to keep them off of things or to move them because we don't recommend grabbing them by the collar all the time or definitely don't recommend grabbing them by the scruff of the neck. So how do you get dogs to move without intimidating them or scaring them or yelling at them or yank, throwing a leash on them and pulling them away? And we recommend naked dogs as well. So the whole leash option is a lot harder anyway, unless you use a kennel lead. But there's a lot of work you can do to get the dogs to just respect the boundaries of around your body. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is doing this with a hula hoop. So if you want to explain that, Susan, and I'll get the video ready. Yeah, so a great way to train new handlers who may have dogs that are invading their space and aren't used to body blocking is to just put a hula hoop on the ground, or if you don't have a hula hoop, you could do tape or rope, but it's to give that visual band boundary to both your staff member and the dogs. And just using tiny steps, forward, backward, and sideways, you claim the space. And so it's using your body to body block, and it's not your arms, you're not communicating, giving any cue, you're just using your body, doing little steps in either direction to keep the dogs out of the hula hoop. So this is a great exercise. Hopefully I've pulled up the right video. The bad thing about this is it doesn't have the title of any of the videos on the <laughs> down below. But I'm hoping this is the whole video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide Susan in a second and make myself smaller, hopefully, so you can watch this video. I you should be able to hear it, but if not, I'll come back on and explain it. But basically the hula hoop game is the starting point that we recommend if you've never done any boundary training before, or when you hire a brand new employee and they've never done boundary training. If you have been around dogs a lot, this is going to come totally second nature to you. You probably body block all the time without realizing you're doing it. So a good gauge is, I think I used this on the example before, if you can get out of your gate at your daycare, let's say you have 20 dogs in the gate. If you can get out of the gate without any dogs escaping through your legs, under your legs, squeezing behind you, you're probably body blocking because that's the way you generally try to do that to get to squeeze yourself out of the gate. But as you get better, you can get the dogs to back up even more. And that's one of the skills you have to learn. But you might think this, everybody knows how to do that. I'm telling you, if you have a brand new employee, they probably don't know how to do this unless they've worked in the daycare before. So let me, okay, wait, keep talking for a second, Susan, because now my mouse isn't working. <laughs> okay. I knew today was going to be fun for me. charge my mouse real quick. Yeah. While Susan's talking. Yeah. So yeah, the gate boundary and what's cool about it is the more you practice it and the better you can get, um, it's, it's amazing But you've got to start when there's fewer distractions. You can't start practicing this during arrivals and departures, but when you do practice it with fewer distractions and you're consistent, then you can apply it during arrivals and departures, which is a real safety bonus to managing the dogs. And it's, it takes away so much frustration for the staff and it's also better for the dogs. It's not fun for dogs to enter a group and just get mobbed. So not only safety, but good for the well-being of all the dogs. All right. I'm hoping that my mouse will work. Okay. Wait, it says connected. So that's good. All right. So let me play this. Hang on. Obviously I have not put the right one up there. Let me make sure. Okay. Hang on. Switching videos. This is all. Okay. With the hula hoop game, the goal is to put the hula hoop on the ground 
and without using your hands or your voice, try to keep the dogs out of the hula hoops. So you're going to basically walk forward, backwards, left and right to push the dogs out of your space that you have in the hula hoop. Okay, so hopefully, let me bring Susan back up here a second. Where did Susan go? There she is. So hopefully you could hear that, but basically that's just showing you that you're all you're doing, and we want you to do this without being scary or dominating or making the dogs afraid of you. So this literally is your the person is standing in the hula hoop. The dogs have no idea what's going on. You could see the dogs looking at the hula hoop and going, I don't know what we're doing here. And you're, all your goal is just to keep the dogs out of the, so you're going to just shuffle forward, shuffle back, shuffle left, shuffle right. The rules are that you can't use your hands. So I usually tell people to just put their hands across their chest or put them behind their back. If you notice, I did pet a few of the dogs because I couldn't stand it, but you just really don't, you don't want to use your hands to push them. You don't want to lift your knee, your legs up. So we're not telling you to knee the dogs or push yourself into them in a scary way. But as the dogs get used to that exercise, they'll start to start, they'll start to respect your space a little bit more. So they aren't pushing into you and they're not jumping on you or they're not trying you able to use your body just to manage them so hopefully that made sense if you have any questions on that particular video let us know but a couple bucks you can buy a hula hoop it's a really great exercise just to play with your team and the same thing with little dogs are actually sometimes more aware of our bodies i think because they're little and they're like well i don't want to get stepped on <laughs> but sometimes little dogs can also sneak by you a lot faster so it's kind of a um, plus and minus, like sometimes little dogs are easier and sometimes you'll find that some of them are actually harder because they can sneak by you without you noticing. And they can be a little bit craftier in terms of, because they're so small, trying to get past your legs. So practicing it with all sizes dogs makes sense as well. And then as Susan said, you can start to, once they, once your team starts to understand how to keep the dogs out of the hula hoop, move locations, put the, lo put the hula hoop in different areas. You can put them near things that the dogs really like to go near a gate or I mean like a fence or a playground equipment. And then ultimately you can use that same exercise at the gate. Susan, do you want to add anything else to that, Susan? No, I think you did a great job. All right. So the net going back to the next step would be then looking at how to use that boundary training at the gates. And there's a little bit of extra, few extra steps that I would include when you start doing boundary training at the gates. So I'm going to pull that video up in a second. But if you want to talk, Susan, a little bit about probably our number one question when we start teaching people how to use this in their daycare, the number one question we get, none of our dogs know how to do this. We've never known. The best time to start this is if those of you that are on here that are just opening, start yeah. day one, start with the dogs when you have a small group. However, it's not impossible to do this when you are fully established daycare and you've got dogs that come every day, but it does take a little bit of practice. So if you want to just go through that again, Susan, just explain that and I'll pull up the video for the gate boundary stuff. Yeah. Like I mentioned, you want to do this when there's fewer distractions and you may even want to do it when there's fewer dogs. So if you definitely have dogs that are more challenging. I would give them a short rest period while you're doing this because you want to set yourself up for success. And what you do is take that same concept, but now you're doing it for the gate. And so you're claiming maybe start with at least one foot around the gate where dogs can't be in. And then you want to get out to two feet and ideally three feet, because then as we talked about, you can use this when dogs are entering and exiting and not have that mob and keep the gate safer. But it's the same concept. You can either, like some people will put tape on the floors to have a visual, or you just claim that space and the dogs will get used to it. And you can go and grab to open the gate. And then that's when you can fake the dogs out and get them to go back again. So it's, again, you have to try this and practice it a lot and then do it consistently 
once you get good at it during arrivals and departures so that if dogs start crowding, you can get back them away before you truly do open and send the dog through the gate that you want or bring the dog in. And we will say for those of you that have participated in the daycare games, there are steps toward to doing this and different employees with different levels of experience are going to have different levels of success. So in order to set your staff up for success, if they've never done this before, you are, the goal is just, can you open the gate at all? And you're standing in the gate. So you're effectively blocking the gate anyway, because you're standing in the space where the dogs would have to go. That would be like a beginner level. So if you're that, so don't make your staff a brand new person. Don't say, okay, your goal is open the gate and be five feet away. And no, nobody's in the gate, like blocking the gate. Cause that's an advanced level. So you want to start small, make sure your staff has small goals that they can hit. Just like with training dogs, you want to set up small, um, approximations of what you're going for and reward them for those successes. But so initially you're, and you'll see this in the video, you're going to see how you would block the gate just with opening the gate a little bit and somebody standing in the space of the gate. And then you, as you get better and as that handler gets more experience and as the dogs start to learn, the goal would be ultimately that experienced handler can open the gate all the way, but not have to actually block the gate. The dogs just start to learn. And then we've seen really advanced handlers then that, that actually work with the dogs to come one at a time when they get, have their name called. So that's even more impressive when you see that. Okay. Let me make sure I'm showing the right video now. Let me start this. This is just all kinds of technology. Okay. Wait. No matter what video I pull up, it's apparently the wrong one. Hang on, I gotta hide this video. Okay. All right, one of my one of my tech things for Be Live is that they need to label the videos because I have no idea which video is being shown. Okay, hang on, I found it. We'll be right with you. Just a second, please. <laughs> All right, so let me play this one. So this is showing how you teach that weight at the gate. With gate exercises, the goal is to open the gate a little bit and then body block the gate from the dogs. Without using your hands or your legs or your voice, all you're doing is really positioning yourself in between the dogs and the gate and using your body to keep them out of that area. I love that dog that sits. Maybe if I sit, it will work. Okay, so there's a combination there of, hang on, let me bring Susan back up. There's a combination there of body blocking like we did with the hula hoop exercise. So you're body blocking the gate, but then you're also using the gate a little bit to help you. And initially, if the dog, you saw initially when Susan first opened that gate, if the dogs come up to it, you close the gate again. And that might be your starting point. If you've ever done door training with dogs where you're teaching them not to charge through the door, it's the same principle. You open, you put your hand on the doorknob, start to open the door. If the dog goes towards the door, you shut the door again. It's the same principle here. So you can actually use that gate to your advantage. So if the dogs start to approach it, you can close it. And then as they started to figure out, oh, I should stay back a little bit, then Susan was starting to open the gate a little bit longer, but then still using a lot of that body blocking to help reinforce the idea to the dogs that they should still not charge through the gate. And again, for this begin, this is like the beginner level. That was Two, I think that was two different facilities like, or two different playrooms, at least. Right. Um, but Susan didn't know those dogs. So that's like a brand new person who has no relationship with those dogs, basically trying to reinforce a boundary. So this actually is easier, generally speaking, when your team who has a relationship with the dogs already starts to do this. 
because the dogs usually want to get the attention of the person and they have a relationship with that person. So it's usually, and you would obviously reward them by praising them, petting them, telling them good dog, whatever. And ultimately you can let them go through the gate as a, as the ultimate reward too. But you're going to start just at the very beginning. And then uh, as Susan mentioned before, with both of those videos, nobody was on the other side of the gate. So if this is done initially when there's not a lot going on in the facility, I wouldn't try it obviously when dogs are first coming and going, and I wouldn't try it right after everybody gets there. Like when you're first practicing, choose a kind of a low key time of day to practice this. All right, let me hide this. And I think we're going to talk about recall, Susan, if you want to talk. Okay. About so that. after doing body blocking and understanding gate boundary, those are connected, but there's two other leadership exercises that we feel should be practiced by playgroup leaders, counselors every day. And the first is recall, which is a basically the come cue. And you can do this without treats, using praise, using that happy voice to try to get the dogs to you. And again, you want to do start doing this when it's a low key time. And so the dogs don't have a lot of other things going on. And the key is you do have to have like the real party and praise and celebration when the dogs get to you. So that for them, a lot of pets and pats make it a happy time so that in their mind, there is a reward for coming to you when you ask them to. As Robin mentioned, you don't want to just do the easy dogs. You want to make sure you're able to call every dog in the group because this response can help you so much when you may have a chase that's going on a little bit too long and you want one of the dogs that to um, come to you. I would call the one that's most reliable to you in the recall. If you need to get them away from things, which is one of the things I love this video, you'll see those poop eaters. This can be a real um, benefit if you really work on the recalls um, and have a party when they come to you, it'll give you time to clean up. So I think this is definitely one of the biggest tools you have in your leader toolbox that can help you keep play safe and the dogs easier to manage. Yeah, and I will say we're talking about rewarding the dogs. I do use food for training, so I'm a big positive reinforcement trainer. I don't like to use food when I'm training in a group setting, though. So when we're looking at rewarding those dogs, I do tend to use more praise, petting, and Susan said having a big party when they do the right thing, as opposed to food. I just don't like to, I don't personally like to use food in a group setting because of the potential for resource guarding and all that kind of thing. But the dog definitely, and especially when the dogs have a relationship with that handler who's in there, they are going to want the attention. They generally want the attention of the handler, but that is assuming that the handler isn't just doing nothing but petting them all day too. So this is an advantage where you can actually get your staff, because they want to love on all the dogs, like we know that, but get them, just like we would tell somebody who's working with their dog at home, ask the dog to do something and then reward them for that good behavior that you want. And so this is the same thing. When you're working with the recalls, you're going to recall them and then give them the attention they want or get them to sit at the gate and give them the attention. And really sitting at the gate, the ultimate reward is to go through the gate. So rewarding them with that is a great idea too, without needing to use food. Um, group sits, you're going to see in the next video, practicing group sits and then tossing a ball for a couple of dogs. So the reward is that they get the go play fetch. You might have a group sit or you might have a dog sit and then they get let through a door. And you'll, I think you'll see that on this video as well. So a lot of ways that you can use these exercises to strengthen that bond between the person and the dog as well. But my personal one for the group sits is calling dogs away from the poop eaters. That's my favorite video or that's favorite thing that's shown on this next video. All right, so this time I know I have the right one because I got rid of the other two. So let me try starting this real quick. So here you see come and use as an obedience cue to get the dogs to move away from things. There's our poop eater. You're calling a dog away from eating poop, which is always a great use of the come command. Group sits. You can use these 
just to get the dogs to focus on the handlers in with the play group. Here they're getting rewarded for sitting by using a ball. Oh, good girl. In this exercise, I'm actually working with a group of dogs that I don't know at all to help them to learn to sit as a group. <laughs> good. <laughs> I love those two dogs that are like, what? And then obviously using sit to get better control of the dogs when you're walking them through the facility. So this is another exercise that you can use. So that using those cues is not only just for, bring Susan back up, is not only just for in the daycare, that one example of the dogs learning to sit at the door can definitely help you when you're managing the dogs as you're walking from one place to another, whether that's taking them to the grooming salon or taking them out to the lobby to get them back to their family or getting them from their family and taking them back to the lodging enclosures, whatever it is, using that sit behavior to teach them to sit at the doors is a great way to manage the overall chaos that happens when you have dogs in your facility. So there's a lot of ways, not just in daycare, that you can use some of these exercises as well. Absolutely. When we didn't talk about loose leash walking is a good kind of goal to have with all the dogs in your um, facility. So having them sit at the doors is a good part of that, makes them focus, have more success with loose leash walking throughout the facility. Yeah, and for those that do any kind of refresher training or they maybe have a trainer on staff that does full training classes, the best way to sell your training classes is walk your client's dog back to them on a loose leash and get the dog to sit at the door. Because when your clients see that, they're going to be like, he never does that for me, which gives you the opportunity to say, oh yeah, we work on this during the day. We could offer you a few sessions every time your dog comes for X amount and we'll help you to reinforce these behaviors at home. It's like the, it's like a no brainer because if you're able to manage their dog and they see that and they are like, how did you get my dog to do that? <laughs> I'm sure we've all heard the owners that say that, then it's a good opportunity for you to say, here's how we can help you with that. And maybe you have an additional add on service that they can do, or maybe you have a trainer on staff that you can refer them to classes, whatever it looks like. But there's no reason that the dog should be you know, charging out of the daycare, charging up to the door, slamming in. I've literally been in daycares where this has happened, where I'm standing like, like Susan and I might be there to consult or whatever, and dogs will be going home and we'll be in the lobby. And you can hear that a dog smash against the door. And then the dog, the door gets open and the dog is like all hyper and they come out. Well, it's cute, but not really. Like for one thing, the dog could get hurt, but that's just like, pure chaos. So you really don't want that either. If even if you don't have training, you should still teach your staff enough that they can manage the dogs so the dogs are safe and they don't have all that chaos going on as well. All right. We are going to wrap up in a second. If you have any questions about any of these videos that we showed, let us know. It's been a quiet group and there's a lot of them out there. They're just in awe of my technical skill of getting all these <laughs> Wow, wow, videos to play on okay. Facebook Live. Anyway, um, those, all those videos, I think all those videos are part of our staff training program as well. So some of you that might have knowing dogs may have seen those before. And they're great, even if you have knowing dogs, they're great things to just pull out occasionally and just do lunch and learns to just remind your team, hey, we should be doing this every day with the dogs. We should be working on this as a goal. And have challenges between your teams to see who can do better. And that's part of the whole reason we do the daycare games every year. We just finished in February. So if you guys were in the daycare games, congratulations on that. But one of the biggest things that we do, one of the biggest things we hear every year during the daycare games is my team is so much best because you just set up a competition with them for around the world with other daycare handlers. So it's an incentive to have some fun. And usually the facilities have fun with it themselves and do their own little celebration. So getting that kind of incentive for them to just be able to learn some of this is huge. Yeah, All right. Okay. So, so Stephanie, what do you say, Susan? And you kind of answered Stephanie's question there. Oh, so Stephanie said, we train young handlers. What are some ways you encourage them to do these exercises? The biggest way 
it depends on the person, but one of the biggest things that I would say is that I would set up some go realistic goals for them to shoot for. So in the daycare games, and actually I can go pull this because I think our leadership exercises are on the daycare games. But Susan, if you can just explain like how we set up the novice and the three different levels for the daycare game, if I can pull that up or give them the link, because I think it's still on the website. I can make it. Okay. Yeah. So your uh, newest handlers would have the easiest goals. And so you would say, I would make this part of the expectation that they progress through these skill levels over time. So they start at novice and then I think it's intermediate and advanced. And so you're setting up what level of proficiency you want them to be at certain points of time. And then just like with, when you're training dogs, when you're training your staff members, there should be some observing to see how they're doing some coaching if they're not able to achieve what you want them to achieve and then rewards when they do it. To me, these are skills that are required to manage the dog safely. So you have to start with that expectation that body blocking is a skill you have to demonstrate gate boundary, recall, and group sits. And then you set up the different levels of progression and have recognition and rewards when they achieve it. It could just be posting when they achieve it and having the celebrate in a team meeting without any type of gift or anything. But definitely these are skills that should be part of the job expectations. So I don't know if this will show up big enough, but I'm gonna have to hide you a second, Susan. That's right. I'll give you the link to this in a second, but this is, this is actually part of the daycare games event goals, but these are the same goals that we would recommend for anybody. So you can, and I'll give you the link where you can print this out, but you can see what Susan is talking about. Novice, intermediate, and advanced are the levels of experience that someone might have. And then there's a master goal, a leader goal, an apprentice goal. So obviously a novice person that's starting out, if they can get 50% of something, that's pretty good. But as they get better, we want to get them up to master. And if you have an advanced handler, they should be getting like 95% success with any of the exercises. And then here you see group sit exercise and you can see this is number of dogs, three dogs, four dogs or five dogs, and how long they sit in a group. So two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, depending again on the level of the handler. So you can see an advanced handler would have seven dogs that they would get to sit for four seconds. And if, so you can set up these goals and I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have people that are like brand new who are going to come to you and go, oh, I'm at advanced level, man. I'm a, I'm advanced master, <laughs> which is what you want. You want them to kind of, and then have some kind of celebration for that. Whether it's, we've seen people that give pins or gift cards or the opportunity to pick something from a prize box, or we've seen people recognition on Facebook is huge. We don't, I think, especially those of us that might be a little older that have been doing this for 30 some years. I think sometimes we discount the recognition that somebody might get out of being, having their picture posted on Facebook and reach a certain level because they're able to manage the dogs using this skill or that skill. So this handout can help you. And that's on our daycare games page. So I'm going to go grab a link to that in a second and I can put that in there. And on the, when you go to the daycare games page, you, all the competition guidelines are on there too. So you can have your own little competition if you want. So there are all that stuff's downloadable. We only formally play the game once a year, but you can play it as often as you want. <laughs> I'm going to go grab that link real quick. Okay. All right. So I just put a link in there to the, it's the daycare games main page. And from there you can get the, if you scroll down, you can get that competition guidelines, which is what I was just showing you. So I would look at that, but I would really look at one of the things that we talked about in some of our other sessions about just rewarding employees in general. And we've got several YouTube videos on building a culture, a team, good team culture. So I would go check those out. But one of the things that we talk about is finding out what your employees really like. And some people really like coffee. Some people really love, like I like Starbucks. So giving me a Starbucks gift card is great, but my husband, not so much. He doesn't really care about Starbucks coffee. So giving him a Starbucks gift card wouldn't be the greatest. I love a Mac computer. He loves a PC. So we have different tastes and your staff's the same way. So find out what they really like 
and try to reward them with that kind of thing. Just like I said, Facebook recognition, there are some people that don't want to be recognized on Facebook. So make sure that you find out, do they really want that public recognition? I would say a lot of people really like that pat on the back, but I think that it doesn't have to be anything super expensive. I think it's just acknowledging that they're making progress and celebrating that with them is one of the keys to that. Come back big with me, Robin. Oh, wait. You're like tiny in the corner. Oh, there you are. I didn't realize I was so tiny. All right. So Tommy said, what cues would you use to get dogs to sit at the gates? So I would, I'll, I use two cues just to be at the gate and not barge through it. I would, I would use three actually. The first would just be what I would consider an environmental cue, which is, this is what I teach for doors. I teach dogs that when a door comes open and I'm there opening the door, the environment itself says the dog should back up and be calm and not barge through the door. That's an what I consider environmental cue, which means mm -hmm. I don't even have to tell the dog. They just learn, oh, here's this whole gate thing. It's just like that one video that we showed of the dog sitting at the door. You can actually teach, and I teach this to pet parents all the time. You should teach your dog that when you're getting ready to go on a walk, they have to sit before they get the door opens. So not because you told them, but because the environment says, oh, we're at a door, I'm supposed to sit. So there's environmental cues. If you're actually using phys verbal cues, I use wait to mean do whatever you want. Just don't go past this line. So that's how I use the word wait. So I would use the word wait at the gate. And then the other word is if I actually want the dog to sit, I would just use the sit cue and tell the dogs to sit. And then the re then you would want to have some kind of a release word that says, okay, you can get up now. Either okay or free or you call their name or whatever it is. I don't know, Susan, if you did any different cues. No, and I think the key is that we recommend you do have an, a set of standard, what are the standard cues that you're using in your um, facility and all your handlers use the same cues and dogs will adapt. If they have a different cue at home, that's okay. But as long as you have a set of standard cues that everybody's using for the same thing, consistency, the dogs will learn that in, when they're at your facility. All right. We wanted to just show some videos today because we, after our last session where we talked about these exercises, we had people asking about what it looked like. So we wanted to jump back on and just talk a little bit about the importance of those cues. And we really do feel like those are standard things that your staff should be doing all the time, but we wanted to give you a few videos to keep in mind.